Hello and welcome to the Practical Creative Podcast, where I talk to people about the how and why of creativity. I want to know more about their materials, their processes, what it is that motivates or inspires them to keep creating. And I'm also interested in exploring the practicalities of being a creative person. And in this series of the podcast, I'm exploring the business of creativity, the skills and mindsets creatives use to share, promote, and sell their work. I'm Jeremiah Craigie, and in this episode, I'll be talking with Jeff Goines. Jeff is a writer, speaker, and entrepreneur. He's the best-selling author of five books, and his award-winning blog, GoinsWriter.com, is visited by millions of people every year. And in this conversation, we talk about his book, Real Artists Don't Starve, where Jeff lays out principles that any creative can use to move from being a starving artist to become a thriving artist. And we cover a lot in this episode, including how being a starving artist is actually a choice and one that you can change, the importance of thinking like a professional, what it means to be original and how it's actually easier than you might think, and why it's important to never work for free. In this conversation, we talk about some of the broader principles in Jeff's book, as well as some of the personal shifts Jeff made in order to become the thriving writer that he is today. If you're interested in practical strategies and guidelines to help you thrive as an artist or creative, then there's definitely something here for you. So you ready to jump in? Yeah, let's do it. Fantastic. So the first thing is just to ask you to tell us who you are and what you do. Sure. I'm Jeff Goins, and I am a best-selling author. I've written five books, and I also... Uh, run an online business teaching online courses and having some coaching and events for other writers and creatives to help them succeed. Fantastic. So what I'm specifically interested in talking to you about is this whole idea of how artists can get more comfortable with talking about money and sales and self-promotion. Yeah. So I'm curious to know what it was that motivated you to write Real Artists Don't Starve. Was it based on personal experience and something that you needed or was it something that you saw that people around you were struggling with? I mean, I think it was both. Uh, I quit my job uh, working as a nonprofit uh, marketer of seven years, um, several years ago. And I did this to become a a full-time writer and uh, I was successful at that. And people would often ask me questions about how I was able to do that. And living in Nashville, I'm surrounded by a lot of musicians and creatives, as you might imagine. And I just kept running into people who said, oh, man, I'd love to do this, you know, make music, paint, do photography, write. um, But you just can't make any money doing that. And I was like, well, you know, maybe you can. And uh, I just kept hearing this over and over again from one group of people. You know, we can think of them as starving artists. And then I would run into a different group of people, people who were actually doing that thing. They were making music. They were doing photography. They were writing books. Uh, they were sharing their art with the world and making a full-time living off of it. And I called these people thriving artists. And it was just interesting because one group of people said, you can never do this. And the other group of people was, was like, well, I'm doing it. And so my intent with the book, uh, in part, was to introduce these two groups of people to each other, or or rather to introduce uh, the idea to a starving artist that you don't have to starve, that in many ways, that's a choice that you make. I know it doesn't feel like a choice, but it really is the product of a certain mindset. And to me, that seemed to be the, the biggest distinction between, say, myself 10 years ago of being an aspiring writer and today being a best-selling author and a full-time writer uh, is the way that I thought about myself and the work that I did. And it turns out this is a pretty big distinction amongst all the um, thriving artists that I talked to and what separated them from a starving artist. Mm, Because I was curious to know, as you were researching the book and, and developing this idea, were there any specific assumptions of your own that you found were being challenged, any beliefs or attitudes that you were surprised to find that you had that were being shaken up as you were going into the research phase of the book? Absolutely. You know, the book that I wrote before this is, is a book on um, finding your calling, your, your dream job. Uh, it's kind of a career book called The Art of Work. And I wrote the first version of this book 
kind of based on all the things that I thought were true, you know, similar sort of, um, impetus for writing it where I'd quit my job and gone and chased my dream and, and succeeded at it. And people said, how did you do this? I'm like, well, here's how I did it. Here are the seven things that I did. And I read that book and I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. This is true for me. I don't know that it's true for everybody else. And I didn't want to write a book like that. And so then, um, I spent, uh, you know, the greater part of a year going and talking to people who had, um, kind of followed similar journeys and were doing their life's work. And, and I realized that some of my assumptions in some ways were tested and that I came back to the, uh, idea of finding your life's work, um, much more honestly, you know, and what I came back with were not anecdotes of things that I did that maybe you should do and, and maybe it'll help you succeed too. And rather I had these principles, these things that seemed to work for everyone that I talked to and everybody uh, uh, who had done this, uh, whose story I, I had studied. And so when I kind of went through that process of writing a, a kind of a bad book based on my personal experience <laughs> and then writing a better book based on other people's experiences, which included my own experiences, <clears throat> I thought, okay, I'm, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to assume that I know what other people need to do without really testing those hypotheses. And so when I w wrote Real Artists Don't Starve, uh, obviously, I mean, anytime you go into a book like this, you've got some level of bias where you think this is how the world works and this is what I believe. But I was always finding ways, trying to find ways to disprove or at least test my own biases. And there were several points in the research phase where I was interviewing hundreds of working creatives in a variety of industries from, you know, cartoonists to musicians, to photographers, uh, to even creative entrepreneurs. And um, there were certain things that surprised me. And the book is made up of 12 rules. Uh, and the idea here is not these are 12 things that I did or that I think you should do, but rather these are the 12 rules that if you follow them, you're going to thrive. And if you break them, you're going to be rolling the dice. You're probably going to uh, you're probably going to, to fail. And, and it turns out um, that these are the 12 things that almost every thriving artist creative entrepreneur, author, um, ha has done, you know, throughout history, including today. And one thing that, um, really surprised me is the idea that if you're going to become a professional, whatever, that you need to set a precedent that you never work for free. And so that's one of the rules that, that a lot of people struggle with myself included, that you can't give away the farm. And, and a lot of people think this is a really good marketing strategy. And it's not, uh, it's actually a really good way to set a precedent that you work for free forever. And it's, it's often a hard precedent to break. And it's not, not to say that some people don't start out offering parts of their work strategically for free to certain people, but in the book, I actually argue that that's something different than working for free. And many creatives, especially musicians here in Nashville, just do gig after gig, job after job, project after project for free, uh, without getting really anything in return. They're doing it for quote unquote opportunity. And if you don't know exactly what you're getting out of this experience and, and know how you're going to strategically leverage it and you're doing this over and over and over again, chances are you're being taken advantage of. Mm, I think, yeah, I think that's an interesting point that you're making that you're, you're not necessarily working for money, but you are working for something that you, you're seeing something. that there's, that's right. Yeah. That there's, there's something on the other side of the equation. It's not just giving it away for free. Yeah. And I think that's an important distinction because sometimes there's a reward that's not financial. And the book is full of fantastic examples of people who exemplify the different principles that you're talking about. But with this one specifically, I'm curious to know whether there are any uh, uh, guidelines for determining what is a good exchange or, or trade or payoff. Because so often, particularly as artists, we're told that, oh, could you do this for free? Because it's, it's a good opportunity to be seen in X gallery or by Y producer. <laughs> right, right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it will actually lead to anything. So is there a criteria for measuring the, the value of what may be on the other side? Yes, I think so. And the criteria, the criterion is um, how you feel 
afterwards. So if you do something generous and you feel good afterwards, then that was probably a good exchange. Uh, I'm not against philanthropy. I'm not against generosity. If you want to give away a piece of art, some of your work, some of your time, because you are genuinely trying to be generous and you feel great after that exchange, good. Do that. That's great. But if you find yourself in the position that many, many people do starting out where you're doing lots of things for free in hopes that it's going to lead to something and people are telling you this is good exposure, this is good opportunity, but you cannot find a way to quantify that or connect what you're doing for free back to something that isn't for free that's going to translate to value to you at some point. Um, in all likelihood, you're going to get bitter. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to blame other people. You're going to go, they're taking advantage of me. And the truth is you're the problem. You're letting this happen to you. And I'm not giving people license to be stingy with their art. That's not what I'm saying here. There are times when it makes strategic sense to make something and put it out there in a place where everybody can see it, say, you know, uh, a blog post, something on Instagram, something in a gallery where people can actually see your art and find out who you are. And that can lead to paid work later on. But you need to be able to connect those dots. And if you don't know how to connect those dots and you're doing this again, you may do this once or twice or three or four or five times. But if you're doing this over and over again, month after month, year after year, uh, and you're getting more and more bitter. Uh, that's a pretty good sign that this isn't working. So I think a really good litmus test is you do this, you feel great about it, good, awesome. Or if you do this and you feel taken advantage of, you feel uh, embittered or confused or frustrated, stop doing that. Because the reality is the world is not going to value your work until you do. Yes, <laughs> that's really interesting. I, and I've got lots of thoughts on that specifically around this idea of needing that we need to value our own work. And I'm curious to know whether since the book has been out, you've found any resistance to that idea, particularly amongst artists and creatives. Absolutely. I mean, the title is Real Artists Don't Starve. So if you're a starving artist, all of a sudden that attacks your identity, right? And so, yeah, there's um, uh, one of two reactions that I get. One is, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, which I think is fascinating, right? Like if all it takes is a book title to get you to question whether or not you're a real artist, um, that's interesting. And the other um, side of the coin, uh, the other reaction that I get is, uh, thank you. This is absolutely right. And it's either coming from somebody who is what I would call a thriving artist today. And, and I talked to somebody, you know, who's, um, you know, been in the music business for uh, 30 years. And um, he said, man, I wish, I wish I, I would have um, been able to read this book 30 years ago. I, I, it would have saved me from so many painful mistakes and, uh, and I also heard from like people who were struggling and starving, but didn't want to be struggling and starving. They were like, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and they saw it as sort of a dare, like you are a real artist, so you don't need to starve. You know, I, I think of it in the same sense where like Steve Jobs and his team of programmers are working on the first Macintosh computer and it's already 18 months, uh, over deadline. And they're like, we need to do this. We need to do this. And he's talking to a designer, some creative, and, and they're talking about a few more months of production to finish the thing. And he resolutely says, as he often did, he goes, real artist ship. <laughs> and so they shipped the Mac, you know, and, and it wasn't without, you know, bugs, but it obviously revolutionized the you know, PC uh, industry. And um, yeah, so like, I don't think in that moment, the guy's like, oh, you know, Steve doesn't think I'm a, a real artist. He's like, you're right. We got to do this. And so that has always been the heart and spirit of it. But, you know, people take it personal. And again, I, I think that's interesting. But um, my intent with the book was always to just say, you've got a choice. I'm not trying to label anybody. Uh, but these are the things that your favorite artist, musician, creative, they did this. Even if they said they didn't do it, and that, that's been kind of a fun process of digging into the history of you know, well, Picasso or Van Gogh or Michelangelo, uh, you know, these people that we think 
I don't know, uh, we think of them as like ideal or idealistic uh, artists and creatives. They had some of the savviness to them. And, and there were a lot of these principles and strategies at work, whether they were conscious or unconscious, I don't know. But my point is with the book, the, if you were creative, these are the things that you need to do to set your creative work up for success. And if you don't do these things, is it possible that you can be the exception to the rule? Sure. Of course, there's always a possibility of that, but you are stacking the deck against you, right? It, it, in, in, favor of uh, the opposition. And I mean, if you're a writer, musician, uh, creative person, you, you don't need any more odds against you. You're trying to stack the deck in your favor. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think that's really interesting, this this notion of what it is to be a real artist. And it, it's something that you do fantastically well right at the very beginning of the book is that you start to unpick the mythology of this romantic notion of, of what the starving artist is, that it's something to aspire to. And and you look at its historical roots going back to La Boheme and the origin of that, and putting all of that in contrast to someone like Michelangelo and uh, the fact that he was actually incredibly wealthy yep. and creating a model of the artist as entrepreneur or as business person. And, and that he was taking his work that seriously that he was willing to elevate it to the level to which he felt it, it should be perceived, which meant that it was not just a trade, but something that had to be appreciated at a higher level. And that he even forced people to acknowledge that, which I think is an extraordinary example because we are so attached to this romantic notion of, of purity and penury that we're that we're connecting poverty and to the purity of an artist. And it, it doesn't serve the art, it doesn't serve the artist, and it certainly doesn't serve the public. And that's something else that I really enjoyed about the book in that you, you talk about the rule of the audience. <laughs> and actually, there's a quote of yours here that I wrote down, one of the many from the book. And it is, before art can have an impact, it must have an audience. And I thought that that was just a fantastic acknowledgement of the need for, for promotion, for self-promotion, of having to put your work out into the world. And you couple that very nicely with the idea of, of practicing in public, yeah. that if you're not sharing your work, then your work can't touch people, it can't move people, it can't affect people. And that there's a benefit to the artist as well in that by sharing their work, they're getting feedback right. on their work. And it's almost a, a synergistic thing. By sharing the work, the artist is growing and, and the world around them mm -hmm. is growing as well. Which leads me to an interesting question, which came from a listener to the podcast. I, I've been asking listeners for questions. And this question is about plagiarism. Yeah. And the concern being that there, there's a lot of guidance that artists should be sharing their work in progress, particularly on Instagram or Facebook, as a way of bringing people into the process and... and helping to sell the work because people come involved in what the artist is trying to do or achieve and, and they start to value the time the artist is putting into their work. But this particular listener is concerned that this will open up to plagiarism. It'll be too easy for someone to copy what she's doing and, and taking her ideas. So I'm curious to know if you have a, a view on, on that specific question, on sharing your work and becoming vulnerable to idea theft versus sharing your work and growing as an artist and growing your audience? Yeah, I have a few thoughts on this. One, the answer is yes. Anytime you practice in public, anytime you share your work in a public setting, uh, particularly the internet, uh, it opens you up to the possibility, uh, maybe even the likelihood, that you, somebody's going to steal your intellectual property. They're going to steal your ideas. Um, yep, that that can happen, probably will happen. Um, but this is not your biggest enemy. This is not your biggest obstacle, which is if I put my stuff out on the internet, people will want to steal it, and therefore I can't make a living off of it. Your biggest enemy is not that people would steal your ideas. Your biggest enemy of any creative artist, author, is people not knowing who you are. It's anonymity. So first of all, it's a little bit um, <laughs> egotistic. And I mean that in the kindest way possible, because I, I think these things too. To go, I am, you know, the fifth billion person, you know, to post something on the internet, right? And all of a sudden, somebody's going to notice me and they're going to want to steal my work. Because just by virtue of putting it on the internet doesn't mean that people are noticing you, 
right? Sharing your work just like you know, that, that's something that I think a lot of people struggle with. It's like I have a website, I have a blog, I have a platform now. People will notice me, and that's it. that's just the beginning um, of getting your work noticed. So yes, there is a cost to getting noticed, which is that people may steal your work from you. Um, but that cost is far less than you keeping your novel in your sock drawer, your, you know, songs in a notebook and your big ideas hidden from the world. And that is, um, like that, that's the thing I would be afraid of is not somebody stealing something from you someday, but the world never experiencing your art. And, and then the last thought I have on this, which <laughs> may not make people so make some people not happy, which is, um, uh, what's so wrong with people stealing your ideas? <laughs> the whole idea of copyright is a very new idea in the history of making things, particularly art. It's the copyright laws and, and the history of them are, are fascinating. You know, I'm, I'm not a law history expert, but it's fascinating. And, you know, it basically goes back no more than a couple hundred years. And, uh, and so, and you see, you're start, we're starting to see the negative effects of this, where you've got, particularly in the music industry, you've got uh, artists suing other artists going, hey, this song sounds like my song. And look, that's, that's very different than me being a college student and uh, literally copying uh, some book or paper, word for word, paragraph for paragraph, paragraph, and, and, and uh, putting it in a, an essay. Uh, and, and submitting it to my professor, not citing any of those, those sources, passing that off as my own work without any editing, remixing, uh, or referencing and saying, this is my work. That is plagiarism, you know, flat out, but you know, a, a chord progression with different words and slightly different melody that kind of sounds like a Tom Petty song. And now I'm going to sue you. I don't know about that because what we know about creativity, and I argue this in the book is that creativity is really just curation. It's taking the same source material that we all have and it's doing something different with it. As the historian Will Durant once said, nothing is new except arrangement. And uh, that is the work of an artist. That is the work of an entrepreneur. That is the work of anybody who is sharing quote unquote new ideas or original work with the world. You were taking all the stuff that came before and you're doing something new and interesting with it. And so there's something important and powerful about somebody borrowing a part of your idea and borrowing several other you know pieces of ideas from other people and then uh, remixing those and rearranging those and saying, see, look at this, look what I made with this. And it actually ends up being something new, even though all the parts and pieces come from existing works. So am I, am I for plagiarism? Absolutely not. No, I mean, that's, it's a horrible thing when you're literally copying word for word, piece for piece, somebody else's work. But there, is there a little bit of a gray line between, you know, that and doing this thing that we call original work? Uh, I, I think so. I mean, I, I think that it looks, especially early on for a creative person, it looks a little bit like copying. You know, your writing sounds a lot like your favorite author. Your songs sound a lot like your favorite musician. And I think that is a necessary part of the process to get to your own unique style. But the reason I mention this and, and that I think it's so important is because if you're starting out as an artist going, I've got to be original and you're unwilling to copy or borrow from any of your influences because you feel like that's plagiarism or being a copycat, um, you are not doing what all of your favorite artists throughout history have done, which is borrow from the work that has come before them, copy the masters uh, that preceded them, and then not stopping there, but rearranging the work, doing something new and interesting with it and discovering you know, your own style and voice in it. And so I think it's good to know that like uh, cultural appropriation, you know, some, we talk about this, uh, uh, co you know, co-opting somebody else's culture. This is the only way culture ever gets created or the way any culture progresses is we borrow something from uh, 
someone, you know, something that someone did somewhere. We go, hey, I like that. I'm going to take that and I'm going to add it here uh, in this new mix and this new scene or space. And with these new ingredients, it's going to create something unique. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting, particularly when you talk about cultural appropriation, because there's, there's uh, clearly a lot of sensitivity around appropriating things that may not be of or from your culture. But it's interesting when you broaden that out to the widest possible idea of culture, um, which leads me to a question about where the line lies between taking on someone else's ideas and influences and acknowledging that versus claiming them as your yeah. own. At, at what point do I need to say, yes, these are my influences and this is something that I'm exploring versus saying, this is this is all my original work. I think the best way to do it is to always do that. Like it's, I'm not saying that, that people do that. Uh, I'm not saying that every creative person does that because you do something long enough and it starts to feel like your own work. But my favorite story about this is Jim Henson, uh, you know, towards the end of his career, uh, which, you know, ended up being, you know, the end of his life, not realizing it. Uh, he died, uh, sadly pretty early and in his life. And he was accepting an award for, um, you know, being the best puppeteer in the world. And he said that his influence, a man named Burr Tilstrom, you know, somebody most people, uh, have never heard of did more Burr Tilstrom did more for putting puppets on television than Jim Henson ever did. He said this publicly. Nobody, most people, uh, you and I, and people who are fans of the Muffets and Sesame Street, the Dark Crystal and so on, Yoda, um, don't know who, who Burr Tilstrom is, but Jim Henson did. I mean, he was one of the first people to do that, to, to do puppets on television in a form of entertainment. And uh, Henson said, this guy, he was the one. He started it. And what's fascinating about that is you, I mean, Google Burr Tilstrom and, and watch some of the shows. There's some, there's some episodes that you can um, uh, buy and, and watch on Amazon. Uh, it is not like Sesame Street or the Muppets or even Jim Henson's early, early work doing commercials for coffee companies. Uh, like Henson did something unique with that, that had never really been done that way. And he was the first to acknowledge that he had his influences. And, and so I think the best way, the most honest way to do this is to never say, this is my own idea. It's to always be acknowledging I'm borrowing from people all the time and rearranging that, that work the best way that I know how. And um, when you can remember it, be sure to uh, say, hey, oh, yeah, this person and that person and this thing all influenced me. Now, of course, we don't always, we're not always aware of everybody that's influencing us, but I think that would be the best way to do it. The line, if we're talking about practice, is um, if you co-opt somebody's work and you don't add anything new to the mix, you're not rearranging it. Um, I don't know if that's right or wrong. I, I'm not here to judge that. Uh, but I don't think that's art, right? I don't think that's what we're talking about here. There has to be some rearrangement of it. You know, so borrowing a sample from a song and then mixing it in with a hip hop beat, that's different. That's a remix. That's rearranging it. Um, you know, taking a certain way of using words and then putting that into a different context and creating a new literary form. That's good. You know, that's rearrangement, but you're always borrowing the uh, base tools to get things started, the basic tools to get things started. And then from there, your job is to rearrange it and remix it and, and, you know, kind of add some new stuff to, to it. And so your creative work is not finding the material like you can't create the clay right the earth creates the clay um and so your job is not to make the clay your job is to mold it into something new and and that is creative work and that is original and you can own that and say nobody's done this quite this way but here's where i got all this stuff i, I think that's a pretty honest way to go through it and if at any point you ever say all my ideas are completely original and th they didn't come from anybody Okay, I guess you can say that, but you're kind of believing your own mythology now, and it's just it doesn't seem to be the way that it works. We are, are all starting with the same source material, the same ideas, 
you look at something like music, there's only so many chord progressions you can put together, you know, combinations of notes and chords before you start repeating yourself. Uh, now there's a lot of possibilities, so there's a lot of opportunity, but people have been making music for a long time. Chances of you writing a song, especially a pop song, um, that hasn't, that doesn't sound like another pop song from some point, th those chances are pretty low. Um, but there are a lot of factors where if you borrow a little bit from here, a little bit from there, a little bit from there, add this, do that, you know, like you can create something original in that remix, but it's all the same borrowed material. And my encouragement to creatives is it's better to borrow and know that you're borrowing so that you can credit it and say, Hey, you know, this person influences, um, than it is to do it subconsciously, which we're all doing all the time. But if you do it unaware, and then, then somebody slaps a lawsuit on you. That's that's a lot more problematic. Mm. Well, I'm curious in that specific example of Jim Henson, whether it's easier once you've actually had success to acknowledge your influences versus being an emerging artist or an artist trying to establish yourself and saying, well, none of this is original here. These are all my influences and uh, I've just rearranged them in a different way because I would imagine that that could start to feel like you're undermining your own creativity and your own expression by doing that. So I'm curious to know if you have a view on that. I can see it both ways, but I, I think it's actually harder to acknowledge influences once you become successful. Because now everybody's calling you a genius. There's more pressure. Yeah. Now everybody thinks you're a genius, you're original, there's nobody like you. I mean, I, I hear this sometimes. Oh, I love your voice. I love the way you say things. Nobody else talks about this the way that you do. Gosh, <laughs> that feels pretty good. Uh, I I have a vested interest, both my ego and my business affairs. <laughs> I have a, a vested interest in believing that's true. And, and because if I believe it, other people are going to believe it. And then, and I can sell that better than, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm just trying to do what this person's doing and they're doing it better. And I just, this is the best that I could do. Um, and I, but I think there's something powerful in owning that. I, I remember uh, listening to an interview with uh, Bono where somebody said, Hey, how did you get that U2 sound? You know, you know, the sound that like bands have been trying to copy for 30 years, including Coldplay. You know, <laughs> how'd you get that sound? And Bono goes, you know, uh, there were all these hair bands and all these, you know, rock, you know, heavy metal bands and rock bands in, in the eighties. And we were just kids. We were teenagers. We weren't that good. And, um, we were trying to sound like them, but we just weren't good enough. And this is what came out. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. that is great. I'm like, I can relate to that guy. <laughs> I can be that guy. <laughs> Because what he's saying is own your constraints, mm. own your limitations. And certainly, you know, there's another track, which is just try to be the best in the world at such and such. That's that's fine, you know, but there's only like one person who gets to do that in every category uh, versus trying to be the best in the world at whatever it is you do and owning it and doing it your way. And you listen to a U2 song, they're all kind of the same and I, I love their music, but there's a sound, there's a uniqueness, there's simple chord structures. Uh, you know, the edge isn't like shredding, you know, he's just playing these very simple, beautiful lead guitar lines and it, and it works. It's incredible. It's amazing. Um, but imagine what would have happened if, you know, you two is trying to sound like, uh, you know, uh, the Scorpions or, or Van Halen <laughs> or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Instead of just going, I guess we'll just do this. Cause at some point you realize, I am trying to copy somebody. I'm not them. I'm not going to do it perfectly. This is what came out. What if I just started owning that? And in that sense, you are kind of finding your unique style. But again, it's it's borrowed from other people. So yeah, I mean, I think in some ways it is easier as a successful person to believe the mythology around your success instead of admitting your own um, challenges. And as a creative person, I really like hearing that. You know, I like hearing gives me hope for you know my own growth. Um, and I think, I think that it's counterintuitive in, in when you're starting out to realize all you can do for, you know, the first few years is probably copy other people and learn from, from that experience. But if you own that, if you're the underdog, a lot of people are going to want to help you, right? 
you now have become their apprentice. You were the case study. And this is a great way to get your heroes and you know uh, would-be mentors and people that you look up to to give you the time of day. Not by sort of puffing up your chest and saying, I know all the things, but by saying, hey, I am learning from you. You help me do this. Is there anything else that you know you want to tell me? And you know, going back to Michelangelo, this is this is how he uh, found himself as a teenage boy in the house of the wealthiest art patron in the Renaissance, Lorenzo de' Medici, by simply going, "Okay, I'm teachable. I want to listen." And he was actually known for being a pretty stubborn man. But there's a story about him working in, in the studio of, a, of, a, of an artist where he was the apprentice, uh, a guy named Domenico Ghirlandaio. And one day this man is walking through the garden. All these students, all these apprentices were making statues. And Michelangelo was making a statue of a fawn. And uh, this man walked by and said, uh, you know, um, what, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm making a statue of a, of a fawn. And um, it was supposed to be an old fawn. And he said, well, if it's an old fawn, uh, the man walking around said, if it's an old fawn, maybe he should be, you know, he should look a little bit older, be, you know, missing some teeth or something. And then he just kind of kept walking on. The next day, the man comes back and the fawn looks older. He's missing some teeth, et cetera. And uh, he goes, great. And he immediately goes to Domenico Ghirlandaio, who's the artist in charge. And he says, I want that guy to come to my palace and I'm going to take him under my wing. And that was Lorenzo de' Medici, and that exchange led to Michelangelo growing up in a house of future princes and popes and you know some of the wealthiest people in the Renaissance, all of whom became his patrons simply by him going, I'm teachable. I don't, I don't pretend to know it all, uh, but I'm here to learn. So I think it's counterintuitive because when you're starting out, you want to prove that you're legit and you're an expert and you're original, but every professional can spot an amateur. Simply because they're trying to act, they're trying to act like they're not an amateur. They're trying to hide it, you know. Anytime you meet somebody who's uncomfortable with themselves, what are they trying to do? Not look uncomfortable, you know. And it's just so obvious to everybody, but you know, the person themselves. And I think again, it goes back to just own it uh, and try to be honest about wherever you're at in the process. And that is almost always more endearing than it is damning. Mm, that's interesting, as well as actually being liberating, because then you're not trying to be something that you're not. You're not, you're not trying to be original, as you say. You are, but you're not striving for that because you're you're acknowledging that this is a process, and part of the process is this period of learning, of right. of borrowing and reassembling, and, and and that's inspiring because it gives latitude to be less original and to 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 actually explore more. Because I think there's often a sense that if I'm going to be unique and original, then I have to have that already. I have to, I, I have to mm -hmm. start now, and this is it. This is my unique voice. But then you're kind of shortcutting the process of developing and growing and discovering because you're you're leaping to the end without going through the twists and turns of, of that exploration and learning of what that unique vision, of, of what is your unique vision and voice. I've got a couple of questions about the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's been out about a year now. Mm -hmm. If you were asked to put out a new edition, is there anything that you would change? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. Uh, what I might do is add more stories because what has been really fun about a book like this is it has affirmed the journey that some people were on. It has woken up other people who realize, oh gosh, I don't have to be a starving artist. I can do this because it's all about mindset, in my opinion, or at least that's where it starts. Um, and uh, it has um, uh, really um, challenged some people to take some practical next steps. And there's been several people. There's an, uh, an artist in Colorado who reached out to me and said, I read your book and I'm a, a visual artist. She paints screens like you know on windows um she gets these old screens and she paints them and she teaches other people how to do it and she opened up a shop in a town called aurora colorado i believe and uh and is killing it and specifically she told me this story her name is rebecca flott um f-l-o-t-t -T. uh you can look her up and um but she told me a story about patronage and she she was basically teaching these classes at, at some local studio and she had a student come up to her saying this is awesome. I 
I want to help you with this. Here's a hundred thousand dollars to get started. Wow. And, uh, yeah, like that's a cool story of finding a patron. How did she do this? She was practicing in public. She was sharing her art in the same way that Michelangelo was, you know, out in this field. And somebody just happened to be walking by and they go, I like that. I believe in that. I want to help. Um, so I would tell more stories, you know, maybe an appendix or something of, uh, stories of, of artists coming out of the woodwork, um, sharing their experiences, uh, you know, because the book kind of gave them permission to do that. Or, or some people who actually read the book and applied it and have experienced great success as a result of it. That's been, for me, the most gratifying part of it, for sure. I also have a question about you personally. I, I follow your blog and you've written about struggling to be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> Not now, obviously, but uh, previously you were struggling to make things work as a writer until you claimed the title of writer. And you write about that being one of the first steps to say, I am a writer, this is what I do. And then, and then things started to shift for you. And I'm asking because I think that's something that a lot of creatives struggle yeah. with because the word artist or, or even writer is so romanticized, it's so lauded, it, it's so built up in our minds that it becomes hard to claim that title because it it comes with so much, so many expectations. And I'm, I'm curious to know what helped you to feel confident in, in claiming that title or that role of being a writer? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's two reactions that I get when I tell, you know, my neighbors or friends at a party that I'm an author. Uh, one is, oh, that's amazing. What have you written? You know, type thing. And I'd love to do that. And then the other is, oh, that's got to be hard. <laughs> you know, so it's like either you're, I mean, I think that's kind of how we think of authors. You're like John Grisham uh, or you're starving. And um, so depending on who you ask, there may be a lot of prestige to it or, or none. Um, for me, it was the beginning of this journey, but the end of another journey. Uh, Stephen Pressfield talks about shadow careers, these things that we do before we find our life's work and how they um, teach us lessons about ourselves, but uh, they're also easy places to hide because, you know, it's easier to be in the shadow than, than stand in the light. And so I was a successful, at least, you know, as successful as, as I know how to be at the time, uh, marketer for a nonprofit. I was the director of marketing. I had a secure and stable job and I began to hide behind that identity, you know, nonprofit director of marketing. I was leading a team. Uh, you know, I was getting raises every year and, uh, I was making more money than I ever thought I would make. And, um, and I was, it was very stable. It was very easy to stay there. And so, um, I did, I did stay there for a while, but, um, this just creeping, sense of there's more, um, kept gnawing at me. And, uh, eventually I had to go, this is not it. This is not all of who I am. And, and I think we're always growing and evolving and, and, and becoming more aware of our true self. But I knew, uh, at a certain point that, that I was hiding and, and I didn't like that feeling. And so there was a secret <laughs> self that I had, you know, this other part of me, I, I loved writing. Um, I loved blogging. I was writing some op-ed pieces for some of my favorite magazines. Uh, and I was like, that was something that I was um, into, but also kind of maybe ashamed of or just embarrassed by. I didn't want other people to know about it, you know, in the way that any hobby that you care a lot about, but you're sort of afraid that other people could discover it. And I just started talking to other writers because you're right for me. That was like, you've got to write a book. It's got to be a New York Times bestseller. You probably have to write five books. You've got to be doing this for at least 10 years before you can don the moniker of writer. And I started talking to other writers and um, somewhat accidentally, you know, to my own fortune, I was able to interview uh, Stephen Pressfield, whom I mentioned earlier, the author of a great book called The War of Art and many other great uh, war novels. Uh, but this is a nonfiction book about creative blocks and how to overcome them. And I interviewed him. I sent him some email questions and he responded with the answers. And one of the questions was, when does a writer get to call himself a writer? 
And this is one of my favorite writers. This is a man at the time who was probably in his sixties. And uh, so like he had done it, you know, he, he was, he was a writer. He was a screenwriter. He had had novels translated into films with, you know, Matt Damon and Will Smith. Um, he had written best-selling books, sold millions of copies of books. He'd written lots of books for years and years and years. He was a writer. And I said, when do you get, when do I get to be like what you are? <laughs> and he said, you are when you say you are forget what everybody else says you are when you say you are. And I thought, well, if that's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. And I started calling myself a writer. And as a result, I was bringing this activity that was kind of in the shadows out into the light. And the more I did that, cause I had to do it right. If I was saying it, I was kind of bringing this activity into the light. I wasn't faking it. I was just talking about this thing that I was already kind of doing, but now I had to own it. And when you start talking about something, people start taking it more seriously and you have to take it more seriously. Now I'm not this guy who kind of writes sometimes. I'm calling myself a writer. And they go, well, what have you written? Uh, oh, I, I, you know, like I had to back it with action. I better go get busy. And that was a very powerful tool for me. And I can't tell you. I mean, I wrote a book called You Are a Writer, so start acting like one. And I talk, I talk about this same uh, theme in you know, Real Artists Don't Starve. I call it the rule of recreation, that the first act of an artist is to uh, – create or recreate himself or herself. And we're always doing this. We're always recreating our, our, our lives and reinventing ourselves. And I have talked to so many writers and creatives when they read that or heard that, like you could just call yourself this and then you get to become it, how liberating it was for them. And, and, the, and the truth is so many creative people are already doing their art, they're already practicing their art, but they're afraid to own the fact that they are a writer or an artist. And I think that is a subtle act of self-sabotage because if you think like an amateur, you're going to act like an amateur. People are going to treat you like an amateur and you're going to keep thinking like an amateur. You're like, oh, I must be an amateur because nobody's taking me seriously. Whereas if you think like a pro, you act like a pro, people treat you like a pro and you start thinking even more like a professional. Mm, that's fantastic. Yeah. And I, and I can see how powerful that, that becomes. So once you made the decision to claim that title as a writer, I'm curious to know whether or not you were equipped to translate that into something that would actually pay. And if not, were there any particular skills or a mindset that you had to develop in order to help you translate that into actually earning an income? Because as, as you said, you were in a paid job that was stable and had a good income. And then suddenly you're going to claim this title of, of being a writer and money doesn't just... <laughs> We don't just give money to writers. They they have to work pro probably harder than many people in order to earn their money. So again, coming from this question of, of creatives developing the skills in order to earn a living from what they do, yeah. I'm curious whether there were any specific mindsets or skills that you had to develop in order to translate that title of writer into a paid career as a writer. Yeah. Um, yeah, it does just happen. You don't just like flip a switch and you go from like – you know, yeah. zero to, you know, dollars. Um, I used to think like, well, how do I monetize my blog? Where's the switch, you know, in the WordPress dashboard where I can like click over to monetize. It starts making money. I didn't know how to do that. Um, yeah. So I, I think that the basic um, rule here and in, in the, prog the progression of the book is basically this. You start with mindset, then you move to market, then you move to money. So you have to think like a, a, a writer or an artist you have to get other people to notice the work that you're doing and and build an audience and then you ultimately have to start charging for your work um so mindset uh uh market money so um i think where there's an audience there's an opportunity to make money now the way that many writers and creatives um, mistakenly go into this is they think this is what i do and you should pay me for it and that's not the way business works. Uh, that's actually not even the way the art world, the fine art world works. Um, money uh, almost always follows demand. So you have to find out what do people want. Now, is it possible to find a patron who's just going to pay you to live and exist and practice your art? Sure, but uh, it's that's unlikely. It's not um, the norm these days. And there is a much greater opportunity to find a niche audience whom you can serve with your art in some way uh, and get paid for it in a way that is both gratifying to you and adding value to them. So for me, in short, I grew an audience 
um, you know, several thousand email subscribers and 10,000 and 20,000, 50,000 and so on. Uh, and I realized these people probably want something and I can probably provide something of value to them that fits with my skill set and passions. I just need to find out what it is. And, and I talked to a, an improv actor who was doing these, um, uh, these comedy nights at these local theaters and he was losing money every night. Uh, sometimes making a profit of a few hundred dollars because he had to rent out the theater, sell tickets, get people to come. And he was charging like 20 bucks a head, which is hard. And then he had a friend uh, in the banking industry, I think, saying, hey, we've got this corporate retreat uh, with our creative team. Can you come and teach us how to do improv like you do at the theater? And instead of you know paying $20 per person, we'll pay you five grand to do this. And he goes, like the same way I do it at the theater? Yeah, same thing you do. Just do it over here. Okay. So he goes and he does it. He makes five grand and he, and he just, this is what he starts doing. And this is what he's doing now. And he said, it was almost like I put all these skills on the table and said, these are the things that I'm good at. Which of these will you pay me for? <laughs> and that's, that's what I did is I built the audience. I said, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I like all these things. Which of these will you pay me for? And this is what I found with a lot of thriving artists. What the savvy ones have done is they've taken a skill, say, uh, you know, writing. And, and then they've seen all of the multiple uh, streams of income that can come from that single skill. Because if I'm a writer, I can write books. I can, uh, if I can speak and communicate well, I can translate my ideas into speaking topics. Uh, I might be able to teach or coach. Uh, I can teach other people how to write. I mean, there's all these different things that I could do just from the single skill. Now, you don't have to do all those things, but understand that any skill you have has multiple subsets, you know, sub skills, uh, based on that core skill where basically you're doing the same thing, but it's meeting a different need that somebody can pay you for. So my friend, uh, wasn't getting paid to be an improv guy. He was getting paid to help that team with their creativity, but he was doing it through the vehicle of, let me teach you how to do improv. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's interesting to think about that in light of whatever your medium might be. For, so, for example, if you're, say, a potter, it, it might be that you're, what you particularly enjoy is surface design, or it, it might be the actual creating of, of the shapes and forms. But those are two very different and right. specific skill sets. So one might lead to, say, um, you know, illustration or, or wallpaper design, and the other could lead down to... Uh, mold making or or designing new products right. in different yeah. media, perhaps. So it's interesting to think about what are my skills and what are my sub skills? Yeah. Uh, because sometimes I think we get blocked by thinking, well, I'm I'm just a potter and who needs more mugs? Right. Who needs more bowls? Right. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Uh, within that, there, there's a host of other skills that might be applicable or, or valuable to someone else. And so it's interesting to think about what other audiences might value those. Um, and and sometimes it's interesting that those audiences aren't where we might think that they would be. So um, in the course of these interviews, I spoke with a, a glass artist and he found an audience for his work and his knowledge in the corporate world, uh, like your friend who, who teaches improv. So taking his skills out of the studio, going to a corporation that, that would say perhaps require a glass vessel with particular heat resistant properties. And his knowledge of glass was such that he can then create that for them. But he's also in that process being challenged and stretched by this new client to push his knowledge and extend his experience further than what mm. he has done before. And then he can take that back into the studio and apply that to his practice and his next project. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that I'm finding particularly exciting about these conversations about taking your skills as an artist or creative and, and finding a way to make money from it is that it doesn't have to be a purely transactional experience. It doesn't have to be, I've made this, you've bought it for that, and that's the end of it. it but actually that it can be synergistic because by engaging in the process of sales or marketing or, or finding collaborators, you're actually enhancing and developing your practice which is really exciting because it moves beyond just being a business and it actually becomes something that feeds you as an artist, that helps you grow as an artist. So Jeff, I have one last question for okay. you, and that is just what's next? 
you, you've, you've written five books, you've explored and challenged this whole idea of the starving artist. So what's next for you? Where, where do you go from here? Uh, good question. Uh, short answer is I don't know in terms of like next book. I'm, I'm working on a few things right now. I, I have a program for how to write a book that um, I've been working on for um, you know months now. That that's coming out an online course on uh, how to write a book called Write a Bestseller. And um, I'm ghostwriting a book with a friend. So there are some things that I've learned about the book writing process that I'm trying to apply to other people to see if these principles work for others and so far so good you know it's working well um yeah and and i think uh and then you know maybe later this year i'll, I'll start working on the next book for me but um always got stuff to work on and uh having a good time seeing um how real artists don't start continues to reach new people um, and i'm having a lot of fun with podcasting so that's been probably my main passion passion project right now is just enjoying the medium of audio and trying to get better and better at that and find um, uh, more creative ways to express myself, you know, through that medium versus just writing. It's been a lot of fun. Ah, how exciting. So before you go, is there a creative challenge or an action step that you'd like to propose for listeners, something that they could think about actually doing that might as they're engaging with this whole notion of, of uh, maybe transitioning from starving artist to a thriving artist. Yeah, I think I have two. One would be, you know, if you've done one, you can do the other. Um, one would be to practice in public. This is the thing that um, separated uh, amateurs from pros, um, meaning that if you wanted to make a living as an artist, at some point you had to be willing to put your work out there in public for everybody to see. Uh, I spoke with a fine artist who uh, did this every day for a couple of years before she got her first commission. Uh, and she was uh, using Flickr at the time. She's doing a new photo of uh, a work in progress, a piece of art that she was making. It wasn't necessarily finished, but she'd just take a picture of it and put it on a Flickr. And so she was practicing in public. People began to uh, notice her and follow her. And, and today she's a well-known illustrator, fine artist, and author. Her name is Lisa Congdon. And it all started with a daily practice of sharing her work online. Uh, I know another uh, fine artist uh, who lives in Indianapolis, who does this with Instagram, posts a new painting on Instagram. And every day uh, now he, he never says this is for sale and people go, Hey, I want to buy that. You know, and it's a painting for, you know, four or $500. And, and he sells almost a painting every day doing this. He's making a great living simply practicing in public. Uh, so fascinating. What can happen if you just start sharing your work uh, with the world? And obviously there are examples of, you know, back in the day, bands putting entire albums on MySpace or even Spotify and just figuring out how can I get an audience so that I can connect it to, you know, my business. And uh, as we mentioned before, that's very different than simply saying, here's my work and it's for free. Uh, you know, if you're building an audience, you're getting noticed so that you can sell them something. That's a good thing. If you have already done that, I think the second challenge is, uh, and, and you've never charged for your work, uh, charge something, put something out there and say, Hey, I'm going to make something. Uh, and I've got whatever, you know, two or three of these or one of these. And the first person to respond, I'm going to, you know, uh, make this thing for you. The distance from zero to one, I don't care what you charge. It could be a dollar, $2, $20, a hundred dollars, but charge something not free. The distance from zero to one is uh, exponentially more than the distance from one to two. And uh, I find that this is the uh, first real step to starting to make a living off of your art is to simply charge something and realize your work has value and there are people out there who uh, value it. That's fantastic. That's a brilliant, brilliant call to action. And it's wonderful because it's it's so achievable. Like, like you say, it could be a very small amount or it could be a large amount, but it, either way, it's an exciting proposition. And I think that's a fantastic place to leave listeners thinking about what they want to do next. That, <laughs> that's yeah. very exciting. So Jeff, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your work? Uh, you can find out more about me, my books, my podcast, all of it at goinswriter.com, G-O-I-N-S, writer.com. Perfect. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Jeff, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to speak with me. It's been so wonderful to talk to you about 
how we can challenge this idea of being a starving artist, <laughs> that we don't need to starve, and that there are ways of going about doing what we do, being a creative in the world and actually thriving as a result in, in all the different ways that we can possibly thrive. So thank you again for taking the time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Jeremiah. It's my pleasure. Hey there! Thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode of The Practical Creative. If you'd like to learn more about Jeff and his work, you can visit the Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life, where you'll learn more about his work and links to all of his materials. And if you'd like to have a go at Jeff's challenges of practicing in public or selling something for the first time, you can find a written version on the Creative Challenges page. Just head on over to the website to check it out. Also, be sure to check out the Resources page, where I've compiled links to all the materials and services referenced by my guests, including books that they've written on creativity and business, online courses, Facebook groups, and some of my top recommendations for learning more about selling and sharing your work. And if you've enjoyed this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast, it would be fantastic if you would subscribe to the show, share it with a friend, or even leave a review on iTunes. I'd also love to hear what you found to be exciting, inspiring, or even challenging about these conversations. You can contact me via the website at thepracticalcreative.life. Until next time. Mm -hmm.